Hello and happy week 16 of the 2023 NFL season in bunches, folks. This is Doug Ferrar of Touchdown Wire and the USA Today Sports Media Group. And the fine gentleman over there, as always, is Greg Cosell of NFL Films and ESPN's NFL Matchup. And Greg, week 16, we're uh, we're counting down. And before we get into the matchups, of which there are several of uh, prurient interest, I wanted to discuss uh, a couple things that are not matchup related, but... Um, kind of the state of the Eagles. I know you study the Eagles a lot. Yeah. Um, the the game winner to Jackson Smith and Jigba on Monday night, I was there. That was fun. I, I seem to be at all the weirdest Seahawks games of the Pete Carroll era. Uh, I was on the field for Beast Quick and the Fail Mary. Anyway, um, so they ran the same play that won the game with 519 left in the first quarter on third and nine. Both times it looked like the Eagles were in cover one, but in the first quarter, Kali Ringo was pressed on Jackson Smith and Jigba. Both times, Sidney Brown dropped from a too-high look for different responsibilities. Uh, but Drew Locke said after the game that he and Shane Waldron had talked about, okay, we got that look. It was a, a backside slant to Metcalf on third and nine. They got eight yards. He didn't convert. But Waldron told Locke, yeah, if you see the corner kind of squatting on the sticks next time, which Bradbury did, go for it. And they went for it. So just your thought, we discussed this yesterday, kind of what you saw from those two plays. Yeah, I mean, the one I remember obviously more is is the the winning touchdown. Um, and Smith and Trevor was the boundary X. Uh, and it, it looked to me like the Eagles were playing cover one because the safety to the side of Smith and Jigbo was Sidney Brown. Right. And Sidney Brown kind of dropped down um, as if to me he was covering the back. That's what it looked like. Now, the others, the player who then became the post safety was Blankenship. But he was aligned on the opposite hash on the on the three receiver side. So it essentially played out that Bradbury, who was lined up over Smith and Jigba, it essentially played out that he was playing zero man on Smith and Jigba because there's no way Blankenship from the opposite hash was going to be a factor on any vertical throw that was outside the numbers. Um, right. So it, would, it became a simple read for Locke. Then you have to execute. Smith Najigba has to get on top of the corner, which he did. And Locke has to make a good throw, which he did. But it ended up being basically zero man with Bradbury, who's not a very good man coverage corner at this point in his career, matched on Smith Najigba. And, and it, it's not a difficult read for the quarterback. Right. And Bradbury's to me, has always been a better zone corner. But I, find it, I know on the third and nine play, uh, Brown, he dropped down on that play as well, and it looked like he was flurrying more toward Kenneth Walker. So that definitely, okay, the back is your guy. It almost, I, I see what you're saying about covering the back. It almost looked more like a robber, like you're dropping down, and okay, that's interesting. As you said, it, it didn't work out fortuitously for them. We usually go on X's and O's, but you and I discussed this yesterday, and given your experience, you've been with film since 1979. Something Jalen Hurts said after the game, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to get macro about this, but when he says in a post-game press conference, I don't think we were committed enough. You had some very interesting thoughts about yeah, that. Yeah, I, I always feel you have to be careful about that. I remember years and years ago, we're going back, you know, 30 years. The one thing that always stood out to me about Troy Aikman, and again, I'm going back a long time. Some will remember, some won't who are listening now. And I always remember listening to Troy Aikman. And whenever the team won, everything was we. And whenever the team lost, everything was I. And yeah. I, that always stuck with me. And I always felt that that's the way quarterbacks should deal with things. That, you know, it's you're the leader of a team. And if you lose, hey, I have to play better. Which, by the way, Jalen did then end up saying. No, he did. He did. Yeah. I want to make that clear. Yeah, we want to make that clear that he ended up saying that I have to play better. But I think is, you want to provide the appropriate context there. Yes. But, you know, I always feel that when you speak about commitment and again, he knows his players better than I do, Doug, you know, I'm not there. We're not there. But I always feel that that that's a slippery slope because you're basically speaking to their effort level, to their approach to the game. You know, the I think those are difficult things. Um, now, again, I don't know what their locker room is like right now. They've lost three in a row. It has not happened in the last couple of years, obviously. Um, you know, they lost a couple of games last year, I think, when Gardner Minshew was the quarterback. But I think people accepted that, hey, Jalen was out and, you know, hey, we could lose a game or two. Um, but they're not playing particularly well on the offensive side of the ball. Um, and, 
you know, usually, usually the quarterback is the one who right or wrong takes the heat for that. Um, right. So it'll be interesting to see going forward. One would argue their schedule is favorable with the Giants this week, then the Cards, then the Giants again. But they've not exceeded 20 points in the last three ga- in any of the last three games. And this was an offense that, you know, put up 30 on average. Uh, good part of this year, certainly last year when they got to the Super Bowl and played at a really high level. Um, so we'll see where they go offensively right now. There, There's throws to be made that Jalen Hurts is missing. Um, and when I say missing, I don't mean with inaccuracy. I mean, for whatever reason, he's not processing it, not seeing it, not turning the ball loose to open receivers within the, the structure of the play design. So that's something he needs to work on and get better at. Um, we've talked about the fact that they don't use a lot of motion. So they're a little bit static in that regard. Uh, we won't get into a whole discussion of why you right. use motion now. We've sort of done that. But, but just to 9% motion after the snap, which is by far, it's 25% overall, but 9% motion after the snap, which is by far the lowest in the NFL. Yeah. So, I mean, there's reasons teams use motion. Like I said, we, we've, we've had that conversation. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we'll see how they, they feel they want to go forward with their offense. Um, and we'll find out, you know, uh, but, you know, they're certainly not playing at a high level offensively right now. We're recording this uh, Wednesday morning Pacific time, and I just I watched a clip from the Hard Knocks of the Dolphins uh, this morning. Uh, they had Mike McDaniel speaking to the team. I think it was the first time after that weird loss to the Titans where everything just kind of blew up in their faces. The, the first thing he did is he put up all the, the play calls he would like back. And he said, I called – before we even get into what you guys did in XQ, I want to show you all the trash plays I called and how I made it harder for Tua – and I think that just curates accountability. So, you know, no matter what your role is, if you're any kind of leader, I think you need to do that. Yeah, and, and we don't want to rip Jalen. I mean, he did no, come no, out no, and no. say That's he, point. he didn't come out and say that, hey, I have to play better too. Um, right. But I just think you have to be careful – when you talk about other players, I think that's now, if you want to do that, you know, in the, in your locker room or in a meeting room, that's fine. I mean, that's sacred space, but I think you have to be careful about saying those kinds of things publicly. That's just my opinion. Some might disagree. Um, The one thing I will say is Jalen Hurts is incredibly intelligent and he's very measured. So in his mind, I'm sure he had a reason for saying it. And maybe the team understands that. And maybe we're making too much out of nothing. We don't know that we're not in the building. Well, a couple of things. I, I think it's it's one of those things where and Mahomes has done this a couple of times this year, and Mahomes has also always been very measured and, and smart about what he says. Sometimes you're sending a subtle or not so subtle just sort of call to your whole right. team. Um, you know, uh, I remember Marshawn Lynch was always like this. Like I was in the locker room for the, the Beast Quake, and he couldn't get out of there fast enough. But if he made a mistake, he would sit there and do chapter and verse in his locker for 20 minutes. It was always with Marshawn. It was, we did something great. I messed up. So again, it's, you know, and it's not the fact that it hurts. Right? Yeah. So I, my guess is it was very measured because as I said, we were dealing with a really intelligent young man, yes. incredibly thoughtful. Um, and, and he's incredibly serious about everything he does. You know, he's not one of those, Hey, let's have fun for the sake of having fun. He's, <laughs> he's really thoughtful. Um, so my guess is it was it was meant to be said for a reason that we probably don't know because we're not in the locker room. Well, you know what else is fun, Greg? Winning. And yeah. That's, yeah. So. Well, they have to start doing a little more of that. Yep. So uh, this is not a, a matchup per se, but I had to talk about it because the more I watched the tape, the Buffalo Bills <laughs> against the Chargers, which, you know, not a great week to have a bad run defense. Good Lord. So generally speaking, Greg, with Josh Allen completes 7 to 15 passes for 94 yards and a touchdown against a team like the Cowboys, you do not expect a 31 to 10 win in Buffalo's favor. That's what happened. And the Bills run game is worthy of our attention. They ran by design against the Cowboys on 71% of their plays, the highest rate for any team this season. And through the first 14 weeks of the season, the Bills ran the ball 81 times with two tight ends on the field, which ranked 23rd in the league. Um, against the Cowboys, they had 22 runs with two tight ends, gaining 122 yards with two touchdowns, 3.7 yards after the con- after contact. Um, we know the Cowboys have been light up front. Joe Brady said the day after the game that they didn't expect it to work that well, but since it did, uh, they were going to work it over and over again. And the James Cook 12-yard run, just – well, I, I'll get into this. It will show the play. Uh, the 12-26 left in the first quarter, they had Dawson Knox and Quentin Morris up on the field. Reggie Gilliam, a fullback, uh, so – 
Oram Cook's runs came in pony personnel with two running backs. Running back Ty Johnson would align outside the tackle, and Johnson had important seal blocks on three of those four runs, which totaled 39 yards. So just what you saw, and of course, Deion Dawkins taking Cowboys linebacker Damone Clark on a 20-yard ride on Cook's 20-yard run uh, in late in the first half. So just what you saw from that Bills run game and how maybe we talked last week about Joe Brady introducing four strong in the passing game and Cook has been having good games, but this seemed like a bit of a sea change in philosophy. What are your thoughts on that? Well, this to me was a fascinating game to watch. It took me too long because it was incredibly tactical. Most yes. people, when they see a run game like this, they just assume that they physically beat them, which they did on occasion, obviously. But I thought this was really a tactical run game. Um, the Cowboys lined it, lined up quite a few times in what we call over fronts. And w- the, the Bills understood that and they attacked the over front with their run game concepts. Um, so that, that was particularly tactical. Um, and they did that over and over. And then the Cowboys in the third quarter started to change up a little bit because they were getting beat tactically not just physically but tactically as well um and obviously we saw them use that little motion hop by cook a number of times in the game and just to, to specify he's going from one side of the quarterback to the other yeah side. and they did that as a motion not as a shift because they would literally snap the ball as soon as he got to the other side and almost every single time they did that with maybe one exception maybe two but i know one for sure he ran back to the other side. So they were setting him up to run back to the side, which he initially came from. Um, But, you know, you mentioned that 12 yard run, which was on the first possession. That was an attitude run. That that was 22 personnel. It was straight eye formation. The Cowboys were in four safety personnel. It was ISO lead week away from the over front. So you had Gilliam leading up on Bell, who's a light linebacker. And, and the offensive guard McGovern climbed up to block the linebacker Clark. So and it had the big time finish, obviously. But that set the tone for the run game and the overall offense. That was an attitude run. That was a yep. run that said we're we're coming out here, we're going to run the ball, and you're going to need to stop the run today. That's the way we're going to play. They had two snaps of. T- 22 personnel on their first possession with full back Gilliam in the straight eye formation both times. Um, uh, but they did a really good job. You mentioned Johnson. They did have 21 pony a number of times with yep. 21 pony is two, two running backs. And almost always Johnson was in a wing alignment. Uh, you know, he was in a wing alignment and there were yep. a couple of times he inserted inside and went up and blocked linebackers and did a good job sealing them. You know, he doesn't have to pancake them. He just has to seal them. Um, but it was a really, it was a fascinating game to watch for me um, because they really under, see, I think they were attacking the front. I know a lot of people said that, well, they were going after Bell because he's light. Well, the reason it came across that way is because he's the weak side stacked backer. And when the front is an over front, the strong side backer is to the strength of the front, which is the over, and that is Clark. So Bell is the weak side backer. So it comes across as if they're attacking Bell. My sense watching the tape, and like I said, it probably took me four hours just to watch all these plays is I think they were attacking the front and Bell's part of the front, but I don't think they, they put the bullseye on Bell. I think they were attacking the front. Well, they, there's a reason they drafted Mozzie Smith, the 27th overall pick in this, in this draft. And Jonathan Hankins has been out since the Eagles game with a high ankle sprain. They've allowed a full yard, 1.1 yards per carry more when Hankins is off the field. That, and that included the Bills game. So, yes, they were attacking the front because the Cowboys right now, by dint of personnel, are light up front. That's just the way it is. You, you can't go out and get like, you know. Well, they're not, I mean, not, I mean, light's a relative term. I mean, Mozzie right. Smith, and he's a rookie, but he's a 325 yeah. pound guy. I mean, you know, uh, Odigi Zua is a guy that may not be 325, but he's a really good player. So, yeah. I mean, in a sense, they replaced Hankins with another, with a 325 pound man. So, they were no lighter up front than they are in any other right. week um, in terms of weight. Uh, you know, like I said, I liked Smith's tape a lot coming out of Michigan, but he is a rookie. I would be fascinated. Not, you know, maybe I can find this out after the season, the whole thought process behind choosing to play this way. Like when the coaching staff came in on Monday and said, um, 
okay, we've all studied the Cowboys now, or let's say it's Monday late afternoon after everybody has studied the Cowboys, and whether it's Aaron Cromer, the uh, line coach, whether it's Joe Brady, whoever it is, maybe it's somebody else on the staff, and said, hey, I think this is our the best way to play this week. I would love to know the thought process there because I think most of us thought in Buffalo the Bills would have a very good chance to win this game no matter how well the Cowboys had been playing. But I think most people thought if the Bills were to win, it would have to be a Josh Allen game as 99.9% of their games are. And this was not a Josh Allen game. So I would just be fascinated to to know what the process was when they said, hey, this is the approach we want to take because it's our best chance to beat the Cowboys. Now, hey, maybe it wouldn't have worked and it would have become a Josh Allen game, but it clearly worked. And it wasn't just that they physically beat them. There was a really high level tactical element to this. Yeah, I mean, if you're going against the Buccaneers or something with their front, maybe you know you got uh, Vea and Cancy up there. Maybe it doesn't work as well. Uh, now they got the Chargers coming up, so that could be a, an. I mean, they're, it's not going to be the same game. It, it, no, believe me, I don't think Josh Allen's going to have 15 attempts in this game. Doesn't mean he's going to have 45 either, but I don't right. think it's going to be the same game. But this is something you know. I'm just I wanted to bring that up because what Joe Brady is adding in, in these you know that sometimes it's small, sometimes it's big. It's pretty impressive. Um, let's get to our matchups, Greg, Detroit Lions at Minnesota Vikings. As regards the Lions offense, it's time to talk about rookie tight end Sam Laporta. Um, I love the design. He had three touchdowns against the Broncos. Um, yeah, which is, I mean, he's, his he's putting up all kinds of historical numbers. Uh, 1241 left in the first half. The Lions ran Jamison Williams and Josh Reynolds on vertical routes to clear out the cover three. Amon Ross St. Brown went, ran a wheel route from the backfield to the left side. Laporta crossed under St. Brown's route and put linebacker Josie Jewell in the dishwasher under the way to the end zone. Laporta's traits in production on the field, they opened so many things up for Ben Johnson, the offensive coordinator. I'm not comparing Laporta to Travis Kelsey, but there is an element of if I'm here, I'm open, and the ways in which the Lions are scheming him up more and more are really something else. Yeah, I mean, I think Laporta's a really good player, and I liked him coming out of Iowa. Um, but a lot of this is design. I mean, the, oh, yes. are you talking about the 19-yard touchdown? Yes. Yeah, I mean, that was a beautifully designed misdirection concept, um, exactly. you know, which had a throwback element. You know, the route combination that you talked about a little bit there, the, the spacing was so precise with the result that Jewel was caught as the only defender who could defend Laporta on the shallow crosser, and his eyes were not on Laporta because of the way everything had played out. So it would again, be Ross Brown, right, going up. Yeah, taking nothing away from Laporta on that given sure. play. Laporta's had a phenomenal year. He's a really good right. player, but they do such a good job with um, uh, with their scheming and with their spacing. You know, I'm not sure there's another team in the league that has spacing with their route concepts that's as detailed and nuanced as the Lions. You have said that three or four times this season on our podcast. Can you explain what the importance of that is? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think when, when you put together again, a lot of this is it, it is zone based, but it, it 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 holds for man as well. What you're trying to do is you're trying to create clear, defined looks for your quarterback based on your route concepts. And if the if routes are too close together, okay, if receivers are too close together, that that muddies the picture for the quarterback. He, he he's just not sure who we can throw it to, where the defense is in relation to the receivers. So what you want to do, and particularly against zone, this is really true against zone, is you want to attack zones with a, different bodies that are spaced out because you want to put zone defenders in some kind of conflict. Okay, because zone defenders are not just playing one player. They have to read the routes and figure out, okay, is that route coming in my area? Do I attach to this receiver? They have to figure all this out on the fly. They may have a good sense of the routes based on the formation and the receiver distribution and location to use, you know, your favorite term, but they still have to see it play out. And you want to be able to space your routes so that if they, if in a sense they have two responsibilities, oh, this guy's coming into my area, but now he's kind of leaving, but I'm not sure. Oh, and there's another guy who may be coming in my area, but I'm not sure. Now all of a sudden he's in conflict and the, it gives a cleaner read for the quarterback. And even in man, you know, you want to be able to be in a situation where when you throw against man, it's clearly a one-on-one, -on -one, that there's not another receiver that's in the immediate area that, that 
you know, muddies the picture. And I think they do such a great job with how they space out their routes. You know, it's basketball season now. And you hear the term all the time about floor balance and spacing in basketball. Yeah. It's true in football. People don't think about football this way, Doug, but in any sport where there's confined space and, and football has confined space, it doesn't play out that way because 100 yards is long, okay, and 53 and a third is wide. You see it more in hockey and in um, in basketball. I mean, for hockey fans listening, think about power plays. Think about the spacing in power plays in hockey. Okay, you have a hockey team now in Seattle. I'm sure you watch yep. it here and there. I don't know if you're a hockey fan. I, I wouldn't say I'm a, the number one hockey fan, but I've been around hockey coaches and heard yep. them talk about it. And it, it's all spacing. How the distance between your people puts more pressure on a defense. It's so much that way in soccer, too. I, I love watching. And soccer is such a big field that yeah. that's hard to see on TV. Yeah. Uh, but my point is in football, I'm not sure people think of it that way because the field is 100 by 53 and a third, and they don't see football as a confined space sport, but it is. Well, you know, Sid Gilman and Tom Bass going to a math professor in 1964 to get the angles right and all that. Oh. I, mean, <laughs> I mean, you know about Sid Gilman. I, I did this. In, on that, but yeah. yeah I, I did this in the book, The Games That Changed the Game, that Gilman went to. Uh, I think it was uh, the University of San Diego, was it, or San Diego yeah. State, to talk to yes. math professors, and you know, because he he was trying to understand the geometry of route concepts and how he could build route concepts so there there'd be a geometric sequence. It it, it all relates to spacing. It's the same deal. Yeah, the triangle and basketball and all that stuff. Yeah, uh, receiver yeah. distribution location. That's number one. Elimination and isolation is climbing up the charts. Or my co-sell phrases. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that. Uh, I think coaches need to do that more too. So, so now Vikings, just, just for who they're playing yeah. this week, we yes. have no idea. No. You know, theoretically what um, uh, the Vikings, Brian Flores right. is going to do. We just have no idea. I mean, it's, you never know. I mean, what we do know is there'll be snaps with three rushers and, uh, and a ton of zone behind it. Cause when he rushes three, he does not play man. He plays zone. Um, right. And then, then how much he will choose to, to blitz. And that will, you know, he knows that we don't, but so it's hard to predict that. I went back and watched because I, I was really fascinated at how, and my gosh, the, the job that Zach Taylor is doing Jake Browning this year is incredible. Is tremendous. Not discussed enough. My goodness. Um, he, the, <laughs> God, the, the long, the sideline throw he made to uh, Jamar Chase with. You mean where he got drilled as soon as he, he threw it? the cross dog blitz and pace came through completely clean and he somehow got that throw yeah, off. That was an amazing throw for a, uh, for a game manager, wasn't it? Well, that was one of those, you know, if franchise quarterbacks X makes that throw, we talk about it for five weeks, but because it was this guy, who cares? But yeah. Correct. You know, so, the one thing that I will say is the last two games, they have really, um, gone to far more 12 personnel the Bengals yes. were a heavy 11 personnel team they lived out of 11 personnel pretty much all year long the last two games and again Zach Taylor is not going to make a public announcement it's easy to say it's a function of Browning it may be it may not be we don't know the answer to that but they've certainly played the last two weeks uh, a lot more out of 12 personnel well let's get them on the phone hey Zach what's going on tell, tell us all your secrets um one thing I noticed from that game um, and, and spinning it forward, Jared Goff has a pass rating of 82.5 against six or more pass rushers a season and a pass rating of 87.0 against three or fewer pass rushers. Goff also has a pass rating of 116.7 against pressure of any kind. This offense is designed for him to get the ball out when he needs to. And there's generally somebody schemed open. And I wonder if with the Vikings, if you can sort of outlast all their crazy coverage stuff and, God knows what's going to happen with the fronts. If you can get to two seconds, do you then have the advantage because so much of this stuff happens right at the snap? Well, I think what you want to do is, as we know, most of the things that the Vikings do, as with almost all teams, come do not come on first down. I mean, they're a big nickel defense. That's their that's what they play because they play with three safeties on every snap. And then obviously when they go um you know, if it's third and long, you know, they bring other people in and they're sub, but but their base defense is big nickel. Metullus is 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 their basically he's a safety, but he's kind of their wild card. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think when you play a defense like that where you may be a little uncertain as to what you're going to get, 
that's where first down passing becomes critical because on for, and they're very good on first down, by the way, um, uh, play action becomes critical, particularly under center. And by the way, a uh, golf by a wide margin has the most play action dropbacks under center of any quarterback in the league. That's foundational to what they do. So, you know, I think you'll see a lot of that because it's it, where you, Look, no team wants to get caught in third and long, but obviously against Brian Flores, it's it's a little different because you're just you're just not sure what you're going to get. Right. And the the three or less, the few, three or fewer or six or more. It's also interesting. The Vikings have played the highest percentage of cover zero in the league this year. They've also played the highest percentage of cover two. Like yeah, cover two. there are really uh, there's a, a you know a lot of there's a dichotomy here because like you know yeah. they they rush three more than every team. They rush they blitz more than every team. Just what you said. They play cover two more. Than, I mean it's it's you know my guess is that after all this time, teams will have a sense of what they're going to get because yeah. there is a tendency. He's not just randomly calling, yeah. you know, calling his defenses on the sideline, you know, with no rhyme or reason. So I'm sure teams that play the Vikings and, and this is a division game. And I think they play him twice in the next three weeks, right. To wrap yeah, up the, could, season. Yeah, the playoffs too. It's, it's uh, this week and week 18. Right. So, you know, believe me, People in that building, whether it's the coaching staff, whether they brought in scouts to do studying, are breaking down every nuance of the Viking defense so that Jared Goff has the appropriate information. Yep. Uh, the Lions have center Frank Rag now healthy again, and they're not the same offense without him. And I just put a quick note up, Greg. Jameer Gibbs, holy crap. <laughs> Christian McCaffrey has the NFL's most runs at 15 or more yards with 18 this season. Gibbs is tied with Raheem Mostert, more on him in a minute, of the Dolphins for the second most of 13, and Gibbs has that on just 139 carries. Basically, every time you, you hand him the ball 10 times, one play could be a house call. So now you've got, like, four guys playing, you know, God knows what levels of four strong. And, oh, yeah, there's this guy in the backfield that's pretty good, too. This is a tough go for any defense. Yeah, well, it's funny because I remember two summers ago, uh, Gibbs had already announced he was transferring to Alabama, but he had played at Georgia Tech the year before. And I was watching his tape, you know, from Georgia Tech because I, you know, I don't know why. You know, I, I randomly in the offseason watch a lot of guys who I, I know why because he was transferring to Alabama and I knew that he'd be their leading rusher. And, then, you know, so I was watching his tape and it so happened that day Fred Taylor was in our building. And he walks by my office and I'm watching Jameer Gibbs and I said, hey, Fred, come here. I want to show you a guy that's going to be a first round pick next year. And he hadn't played at Alabama yet. And and. So Fred Taylor watched, you know, a couple of plays and he goes, oh, my God, this guy is just unbelievable. And Fred Taylor probably knows a little more about playing running back than I do. That would be my guess. Um, uh, but, um, you know, I remember watching Gibbs when he was at his Georgia Tech tape and he, you could see it right away. The guy just was special. And obviously he's, uh, you know, and I think he's he's being used the proper way. I mean. To me, he's not a guy you're going to say, let's build our offense around Jameer Gibbs and give him the ball 25 times a game. He's not that guy. He's being used exactly the right way. The way you just – it's interesting because they have so many weapons. They don't really – the Lions, maybe you disagree with this, they don't really build their offense about any, around any one guy. No, and, and that's interesting you say that because I feel the Niners are the same way. Now, obviously, McCaffrey is a feature yeah. back in a strict sense, but in the pass game – you know, it's not built around, hey, we have to get the ball to Samuel today. We have yeah. to get the ball to IU today. Oh, George Kittle needs 12 targets today. Right. They're not really built that way. And it's advantageous because, well, now who do you focus on? It's like, okay, good luck. Good luck. Uh, so Dallas Cowboys at Miami Dolphins. To get back to that Cowboys run defense, they've been at, you know, the Hankins thing. People do not talk. It's like if, if an offensive, if, if one side of the ball is good, they're like, we have a limit in our brains. We can talk about three or four guys, and then we have to stop. So no one talks about Miami's run game. We had talked about most of its explosive runs. They are so versatile and effective. We have to remember that Mike McDaniel is Kyle Shanahan's run game coordinator from 2017 through 2020. And so you get a lot of the same, you know, explosive plays out of heavy personnel and all the motions and all the displacement. And it, but it's like ticked up to 120% speed wise. I mean, we go back to that 70 to 20 win over the Broncos in week three. The Dolphins had 350 rushing yards and five touchdowns on 43 carries. So if you're the Cowboys, Greg, how do you deal with that? And the fact that even if Tyree Kill isn't in there, and I don't know what his status is, Miami's offense can still just beat the crap out of your secondary. Yeah, I mean, they're a tough matchup, you know, for many reasons. Um, 
the key, you know, obviously the run game is important. We know they can run the ball and, and we'll see how they choose to run it. You know, it's not going to be the same way that the bills ran it because it's just not going to be the same, you know, no, because Miami can run it pretty much any way you want. Yeah. And, and we know that Mike McDaniel with his background with, with Kyle Shanahan, that they, they do want to run the ball. I mean, they, they've thrown it really well and they've had a lot of big plays obviously in the past game. And you would assume Tyreek Hill's back this week, but it's not going to be the same as what Buffalo did. Um, no. You know, normally when they're playing well, the ball gets out quick because it's funny watching that Buffalo tape this week. And obviously Buffalo didn't have a lot of pass attempts with, with Josh Allen. Um, and when they did throw it, for the most part, it was a lot of quick game stuff because they didn't really get behind the sticks very much. Um, but they couldn't block Micah Parsons. The Bills, in the first half, Micah Parsons ate up whoever he was going against, guard, center, tackle, and he just ate them up. And Miami's now playing with a hurt offensive line. So the key question is, to me, and it always is when you play – this team and who was it two weeks ago that did a great job? Not this past week when, when Miami lost, um, who was uh, Titan. the Titans? Yeah. The Titans did a really good job by the way. And it all starts with taking away the first window throws and then the pressure is a factor. So, you know, I'm not saying you forget about the run game because they can certainly run it really, really effectively as we know. Um, but, What's the last thing you want to have happen? The last thing you want to have happen is a first window throw to Hill for 17 yards that becomes a 60-yard touchdown. That's yeah. the last thing you want to have happen. So, yeah. again, I'm not saying you play the run game, in a sense, out of your pass defense, but in some ways you do because it's it, it's the passing game that, for the most part, gives them the more explosive plays. To a tag of Lailoa uh, against the Jets uh, last Sunday, average career low time to throw 2.8 seconds. There you go. 2.08 seconds, just over two seconds on average time to throw. So Yeah, so that, I mean, the ball gets out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dolphins have jumped from 26 to fourth in defensive DVOA since week 10, so this is no pushover even against Dallas's offense. Uh, Bradley Chubb had, four, Chubb had four sacks and seven pressures against the Jets in week 15. Yeah, it's the Jets, but still. Um, Christian Wilkins is doing his thing. They got some really good under uh, under the radar guys, Zach Sealer and Andrew Van Ginkle and David Long Jr. Uh, Javon yeah, Holland. Sealer's a really good player. I like him yeah. a lot. But my gosh, and, and Javon Holland loved him coming out. It's been great. Jalen Ramsey has a lot 11 catches on 27 targets. Yeah. No touchdowns, three picks, two pass breakups, and an opponent pass rating of 19.9. The NFL's lowest among cornerbacks playing at least 20% of the And I think, though, the thing that's overlooked about Ramsey by many, because, you know, he really hasn't played a ton of man coverage the last number of years because of the teams he's been with, not being high percentage man-to-man -man teams, but he is a great zone coverage defender. Yes, he is. He may yes, be he as good a zone coverage corner yes. as there is in the league with his ability to understand routes, route design, route concepts, how to – how to manage the conflict that that routes can put you in. You know, I mean, he is, he's a master at it. He's, he's as good as own defender as there is in the league. And we know he can line up and play press man if need be. When I was watching his tape this morning, just reflective of those numbers and just kind of what I've seen, I, I, I was struck by just, he's such a good match guy. Just, you know, once he's on you, he's all the way through. Yep, he's, uh, yeah. The Dolphins play a terrific coverage. player, a terrific yeah. player. Dolphins play cover six, 26.3% uh, of their snaps. No surprise with Fangio. That's number one. So then you have, you know, this side and this side. And Ramsey isn't a traveler, but he did more against the Jets, and they were lining him up more with Garrett Wilson. So I wonder, like, is the plan for him to be on Lamb or is it on Ferguson, who's become a lot more of a threat? I don't think he'd be on Ferguson, but that's just my opinion. Yeah. Um, I mean, Ferguson's but, a tight end. I don't think they're right. going to put him on Ferguson. Right. Um, but just in general, like what the plan will be. Well, the, the thing about Lamb, too, is the Cowboys use Lamb. He moves around a lot, and he's their motion receiver. So and unless they are going to commit to Ramsey as a true matchup corner, which I don't believe they will, but, you yeah. know, hey, Vic Fangio certainly knows more than I do. Um, well, I, I think he before the Jets game, I think he traveled like – 5% of his snaps, and it was like 25 against the Jets because I think they wanted him on Garrett Wilson. I don't think they're going to – you know, that has not been the way they played since they got Ramsey. That has right. not really been their MO. That may have been an exception. I don't know. Yeah, uh, we'll it see. was. Yeah, uh, certainly. Uh, final matchup, and we have to go quick against the game of the year. Good God. That's all right. We, we're good. 
Baltimore Ravens at San Francisco 49ers. You mentioned something on our phone call briefly I'd like you to expand on. Uh, you said, and it wasn't like a huge gap maybe, you said you didn't think Lamar has played as well recently. Could you expand on that? Um, I, I think that, you know, just in terms of, 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 it was two weeks ago in particular, that I, you know, I didn't think he had a great game, but he makes great plays. And I think mm-hmm. he's still a extremely comfortable player. Not every, you know, here's the problem we face. And this is what social media does. And someone's going to hear this and go, oh, you know, you're a hater. But, you know, there's 17 games now. Not every quarterback plays great for 17 games. It doesn't mean you're a bad quarterback. Okay, I think Lamar overall this year has played at a really high level. I think he's clearly a comfortable player within the, the Todd Monk and offense. I think that he's clearly made a conscious effort to throw the football more from the pocket and not leave the pocket, and that's helped their their overall offense. It's 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 just helped the pass game become better. Um, he still always has that parachute, the ability to run when he truly feels as if nothing's there, and he's still phenomenal at it. But he hasn't done that quite as much this year because he's let the offense work for him. And I think that's a good thing overall, particularly as he continues his career. Um, So is, is he great every single week? No, but he makes throws. I mean, I thought the touchdown he threw to likely this week was a really, really good throw. It was a relatively tight zone window and he stuck it right on him. You know, he's always going to make those special improvisational plays, but you know, people have to understand that no quarterback is great every single week. We can't get into a reevaluation of quarterbacks on a weekly basis. And to sure. say that he didn't play great last week, which he did not this past week, I'm talking about the week prior, you know, right. doesn't mean that he's a bad quarterback. You know, it, it, it just doesn't work that way in the league. You can't be great every week. And the good thing, you know, that's the thing when you have a good team, and they have a very good team. Their defense is really, really good. Now, losing Mitchell is going to be interesting because they don't have another back like him. But I'm going to bring up some numbers on that. That's a major hit. Yeah, but my guess is they're going to work through that and be okay, Doug. I know he's a major loss, but my guess is they'll work through that and be okay. Well, it's just, this is this is Lamar in a nutshell, right? Because you have the kind of structured pass to likely the touchdown, and then the the pass that everyone's talking about to likely, where I mean, <laughs> he somehow gets out of like three sacks and makes that crossbody throw, and everyone's converging. And Dwayne Smoot is there, like, how in the hell did you do that? So it's like, here's the structure, and here's the I don't even know what throw the cereal out and, and see what happens. That's that's Lamar. Yeah, um, and, yeah. and he can do that. So with Keaton Mitchell out for the rest of the season with torn ACL, I really hate this. What the Ravens, what do the Ravens do to keep the Ravens? Gus, Gus Edwards has been the other explosive back, but Mitchell was averaging 5.68 yards after contact on 47 carries this season. No other Ravens running back has over three. Just saying. It, it, so I, I wonder how they're going to, to you know, do, do they do more power stuff? Do they rely more on Lamar as the explosive element? Because because Edwards can make explosive plays in the run game. I've no seen. question. We'll see. You know, and they'll they'll have a way to, to deal with this. And you know, and Lamar. Who knows? Maybe they'll go back to Lamar being a little more of a design run game factor, where they do some more zone. Re, you know, yeah. they, they'll they'll have ways to deal with this because of Lamar. I mean, he yeah. can do all these things. Sure. You know, he's an incredibly dynamic player. Um, so we'll see. You know how this goes forward and it is a loss we're not saying it doesn't matter but i think they can figure this out and i i I don't think it will be of course if they lose this week and they could the niners are really really good and they're you know they're on the road then people are going to say oh that that's the reason but it won't be the reason they're going to figure this out Christian McCaffrey's 41-yard catch against the Cardinals with 13-28 left in the third quarter. I'm sure you know the play was a nice example of why he presents so many more problems you're talking about the touchdown yeah, most no. This was uh, it wasn't a tight. It was forty-one yard catch, thirteen twenty-eight left in the third quarter. Did, Arizona, from this past week. Yeah, Arizona was in cover four. Niners had Brandon Ayuk running it over to get to the passing, get the passing strength going to the right alongside Debo Samuel's vertical route to the right. So everyone goes that way. Jalen Thompson, the safety, has McCaffrey coming out of the backfield. Thompson hands McCaffrey off to nobody because Buda Baker is following Ayuk over. McCaffrey breaks past Thompson. Brock Purdy trolls out of the background against pressure. There is no defender within 10 yards of McCaffrey when he catches the ball up the numbers. I'm not saying that the Ravens will have similar breakdowns. You sure this wasn't the touchdown? 
think it may have been. Let's let. Okay, I don't have it up. I may have forgotten to put that in my. It notes. was a touchdown because I don't okay. think he had another forty-yard reception. Yeah, forty. Yard, so that let's call, he he might have fallen down and gotten back up and just run unobstructed in the end zone. That was the play. Yeah. So um, that I'm was not an seeing... interesting play because what they did is they lined up in what was basically 12, uh, 21 balanced. And they had used check yes. essentially lined up as one tight end, which he often does. And McCaffrey was in the backfield and McCaffrey worked through the formation. Um, he he kind of ran, ran a wheel route. And I think because he came through the line of scrimmage, they just didn't account for him properly. Um, right. You know, but I don't think that was it, it became a second reaction improvisational play because of um, the pressure that was immediately put on right. Purdy up the middle by Lopez. So Purdy had to spin out to his left. But but I think that play was it was I think it was a designed rail route. You know, obviously, once Purdy leaves the pocket, I think the defense gets a little discombobulated. But they did not react to him because he came through the, the line of scrimmage and their and defenses are usually not used to that. Well, the killer here is I'm watching it over and over, and I'm thinking, okay, so he goes to the second level, box safety, and Thompson's a good player since he came out of uh, Wazoo, go Cougs. Um, it, it's like, well, this could be a choice route or it could be an angle route, and he will demolish you with those. But in this case, he's just going upfield. So with McCaffrey, it's like I have so many options in my head trying to cover this guy. It's just ridiculous. And we, we talked about the Lions. And these are my notes. They line multiple people up all over the place with multiple potential responsibilities. And in McCaffrey's case, you can't think of him as just a running back flaring out. This guy is a legitimate receiver in addition to all the nightmares he presents as a back. It's just tough. No question. I mean, I think, you know, his his touchdown, his um, eight-yard touchdown catch, mm -hmm. I think it was eight yards. Um, I think that's a really, really good example of that because I think he's part of that progression. That wasn't, oh, he, he's going to run an angle route as kind of a check down. He's part of that progression. And right. uh, and I think, you know, they do that a lot with him. And they do that a lot in, in the red zone, but obviously they can do it anywhere in, in the field as well. And the problem is you never know. <laughs> it's just, it's a problem. Um, so we'll put that play up as well. And the 41 yard touchdown. Hi, Doug. Um, Greg, I need to talk about Justin Matabuike again. This is our weekly Justin Matabuike segment. I'm not going to shut up about this guy. Against the Jaguars last Sunday, he had a sack and six total pressures from five different gaps. I love those guys. I love the gap, you know, the gap versatile guys. He's just so good. Well, that's what they, that's one thing that they do. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they're very multiple with their front looks. They move people around. Uh, they'll show a lot of pressure fronts with six or seven on the line of scrimmage. It'll be disguised, then they'll back out. Um, you know, it'll be interesting because Marcus Williams, I don't know if he's going to go this week as you and I do this on a Wednesday. I think yeah, I know. Uh, Harbaugh said after that amazing play he made at the end of the first half to keep the clock going, I, Harbaugh said he re-injured himself on that play. So I Yeah, he know. did because he didn't play in the second half. And the thing that was really interesting about – what happened in the second half is with him out, and obviously they had to adjust in game. Obviously now they have a week if he's not playing to see if another player can play, and I think they do have another player. <clears throat> but in the second half, Hamilton ended up playing on the back end most of the second half. Now, obviously, to me, the three key players on this defense in terms of versatility and how they're deployed are Hamilton, Queen, and Smith, the two linebackers. Um, obviously, their D-line has played well, but they're D-linemen. They're going to line up as D-linemen. Um, uh, so we'll see, you know, who plays if he can't go and how that, how that gets kind of mapped out. Yeah, one more real quick thing, because I don't want to be the one responsible for you being late to narrate NFL matchup. We know that the 49ers offense is flat out ridiculous. They've been the first overall on DVOA throughout the entire season. Their defense since week 10 has jumped from 12th to first in the NFL. So right now they're number one on both sides of the ball. I'm one of the founding members of the Chevarius Ward fan club. <laughs> Give me a couple of underrated guys that have stood out, not Bosa and Warner, you know, the guys we know, but a couple of underrated guys who really added this improvement. And let's take Chase Young out too, because we know who he is. Well, most people probably know about Greenlaw, um, you know, yeah. but I think he's a really good player as well. He'd be a number uh, one linebacker on like 25 different teams. Yeah, I mean, he's a really, really good player. Um, you know, I think on their D line, and, and particularly it was kind of noticeable, I think, this week because Hargrave and Armstead were out. I think Gibbons is a really nice rotational piece yeah. for them. Um, you know, normally they'll play 15, 20 snaps a game. And he I played, think a guy that's. They go to five man, Francis. Is he kind of the nose? 
well, they don't really play a lot of five man fronts. Right. But if they do, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the other guy who's played a ton of snaps this year, and he's not a sacker, and it's why he's, you know, he was a fourth round, a fourth pick in a draft at one point, but Cleveland Farrell has played really, really well for them. And he probably plays 45% of the snaps every single week, and he wouldn't be doing that. You know, a lot of people thought when they got Chase Young, oh, well, he's going to sit now, but he hasn't. And and the reason he hasn't, obviously, is because they feel like he plays well, and I think that shows up on tape. Well, you have to rotate your defensive linemen these days. That's the way it goes. Yeah, and, and he's I think he's been kind of, a you know, one of those – sort of solid players, those core players that every defense needs. We've discussed this about the wow guys and how overcooked that gets. And would you rather have one wow guy or three really good guys and ask the Carolina Panthers about that? Yeah. Anyway. Well, well great. You know, yeah. it depends on the rest of your team, obviously, yeah. too. Yeah. Um, if you're one wow guy away, that might be nice. So, Greg, as always, you're our wow guy. Uh, thank you so much, as always. And we'll be talking more X's and O's next week. Thanks, Doug.